I got a phone call from Pakistan saying that my son had been arrested and he was facing death by hanging. I remember thinking that can't be possible. This guy sent me here. I don't know anything about any drugs, I swear to you. I couldn't have anticipated things happening the way that they did. Eric couldn't believe his friend would do this to him. Someone put a 5,000 rupee bounty on my head. And uh, when someone ever asked me, hey, what's your life worth? My, my life is worth $87. Who give you the drugs? Because I'm innocent, I had no right answers for them. Peter. So nothing I say is going to make them stop. Thưa quý vị, chúng tôi xin cảm ơn sự theo dõi trở lại của quý vị khán thính giả. Trong phần 2 thì tôi Uyên nói chuyện với nam diễn viên trẻ anh Eric O'Day. Cuốn phim tài liệu mới nhất của anh mang tên là Three Years in Pakistan, The Eric O'Day Story. Đây là một câu chuyện rất là cảm động, rất là hay. À, và đây là đã xảy ra với anh đầu năm, từ năm 2002 cho đến năm 2004. Anh đã bị nhốt tù bên Pakistan 3 năm mà họ nói với anh là bởi vì cái tội buôn uh, ma túy nhưng mà anh 3 năm ở tù tra tấn dã man anh nói là anh vô tội anh không biết cái uh, ma túy đã bỏ vô cái cái hành lý của anh uh, phần hai chương trình thì tôi xin được tiếp chuyện với anh tiếp về và xin được uh, nói chuyện với anh bằng tiếng anh so what was your first impression when you arrived in Islam, in Islamabad Pakistan was was it shock compared to Greece to, no, Turkey. Oh, Turkey, my bad. No. Turkey, uh, yeah. No, there was just a lot of people. Yeah. You know, everyone, every place has its own flavor with things. I just thought it was great. Like, I wasn't like shocked, like, whoa, I just thought there was a lot of people. There you weren't was... afraid or anything. Right? Nah, I wasn't afraid. Like, <laughs> I'm the guy, everyone's like, how do you know, how, how could you just travel out? Or how could you trust happened? someone? <laughs> yeah. I figure a smile, you know, will, 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 qual, qual, you know, will stop any bad situation, yeah. you know? I was just very adventurous, very trusting. So I got really sick and come, come February uh, 14th, Valentine's mm -hmm. Day, I, I'm like counting the minutes until I can get on the plane and go to Sweden. Because Sweden always had fun. And Sweden's beautiful. Sweden's nice. There's, you know, I was thinking of the candy that I yeah. was going to get there because they got some really good candy in Sweden. And until uh, until when? Friday comes along. It's early. I'm waiting to get to the airport. And I find out the hard way that I was, <laughs> that I was really being used to smuggle narcotics. They found 3.6 kg of opium in my bag, which will all be explained in the documentary. And uh, um, had I, for the next three days, I'd be tortured for information I didn't have. And I was... I so was, what kind of torture did they, they thought uh, that what they would use on you that you would confess? They, uh, they like to beat the bottom of your feet. It was, oh. They'd beat the bottom of your feet. They'd uh, hang me up like a punching bag and just go rocky on me. They electrocuted oh. me and they drowned me. And uh, they, they, didn't, they, would, they would put me on a board and, and open it up into like a big, dirty fish tank. Oh my gosh. And that's... Uh, was that the worst? I mean, all of it combined was bad. It was just, it was dehumanizing. Yeah. It was embarrassing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was more embarrassing than it was painful for me. Mm. But it was, it, I couldn't believe this, is ha this, this is allowed to happen. You think this, you see this in a movie and you, you think, okay, it's a movie. Yeah. But this stuff happens to people. I mean, that's, I was tortured for information I didn't have. And because I didn't have the right answers, uh, they weren't happy and they weren't going to stop. They just wanted me to admit the drugs were mine on the third day. E even though they know it wasn't you, they knew that you were innocent. They but didn't they, know this. Um, they didn't know from this. From their side, they still oh, assume that you, you're from, the drug smuggler. From their side, this is just their right. job. Their job is to beat the truth out of you. And how did your family receive this horrible news that you're, you are now in prison in uh, Pakistan? Uh, someone from the embassy contacted my mother. Mm. And told and told her what was happening. And my mom was telling him, "Look, my my son was working for Ray Gazarian. He's absolutely innocent." Um, I understand from other people's point of view because I used to be that way. When you hear someone's in jail for drugs, well, they got what they deserve. Mm. You don't think that they didn't do it. You want to believe that they were guilty because when you know that somebody's going through something as bad as what I was going through, it's easier to to swallow yeah. when you believe they, they they deserve it. Yeah. So in this documentary, you mentioned several times that your innocent meant you would eventually be cleared and released. I guess you were right, but can you talk about what it cost you? 
Uh, well, what, six months after I was arrested, the DEA came in and they had arrested uh, Ray Gazarian um, oh. because he, because a Swedish woman working for him lost her luggage at JFK Airport, oh. but she continued on her itinerary to LAX. They found in the walls of her suitcase, like if you open the suitcase, it looks like an empty suitcase, but it's so professionally hidden in the walls that you can't wow. see it. Wow. So they found in the walls of her suitcase opium and arrested her. She's like, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. And they set up a sting. They arrested her and another man by the name of Raz McManassian. Mm -hmm. That man posted bail. But my mom had a private investigator looking for this man. And he was able to say, this might be the same guy that set Eric up. And so when they rearrested him, denied him bail, knowing that he had several aliases. When other people came forward going, look, we were making these trips too. We didn't know. Because their story and my story mm -hmm. match the Swedish girl's story. She got released back to her country in less than two weeks without being charged. So at least by my being in jail, she wasn't. So that was good news. My, my documentary touches base on the first year, which was just hell for me. Yeah. But I had started learning the language. Yeah. And, and your best weapon in jail in another country or anywhere is communication. Yeah. That's your best weapon. So once I started learning the language, of course fighting helps, but you, learning how to speak their language is what really started to help me because yeah. they started to see me as a human being. Yeah. And I started to see them as human beings. Yeah. And I started to have friendly conversations and tell jokes and, you know, and, and people would laugh and, 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 and smile and it became, you know, less stressful and less dangerous. And the first year was, was just hell for me. Mm. But the second two years weren't that bad for mm -hmm. me. I mean, and, and when it comes to way sink or, a sink or swim situation, mm -hmm. I was jet skiing in prison. I, and it, it just, you came to me if you needed stuff. The guards all started working for me. They all started having lunch with me, breakfast with me. The, you know, people, as soon as you know the language, things as just... As soon as I started learning the language, yeah. as soon as I started you know, helping people out, I had a garden. I, I had a, I have a pretty good green thumb, and I worked in a garden, and I mm. fixed all the cell blocks, and I brought in a well, a water well, so that we would have uh, better, cleaner water for our cell block. You know, I, I did things to make my life a lot easier, easier. but everyone else benefited off of yeah. it. Yeah. And it, it uh, I had friends in prison and yeah. I learned a lot in prison. And when I left jail, yeah, I was ready to go home, but I was also sad because mm -hmm. I was going to be leaving a lot of friends behind. Wow. And one of the friends that was mentioned in this documentary named Murad. Murad. <laughs> Do you still think about him? I think about Murad all the time. Yeah. One of the coolest guys. Murad and I met on death row. We were, uh, you know, he, I, he was teaching me Urdu. I was teaching him English. And one thing he loved to do was play poker. Mm. And the first time I ever played a hand of Texas Hold'em poker was on death row with Murad. Mm. And for years, uh, I would play poker with Murad and the other guys. And when I got taken out of death row after nine and a half months, I would still come back and visit him after my sentencing because I was, a te um, I was given the job as a teacher in prison. And when you're given a job as a teacher, you can go to different parts of the prison under the guise of your teaching people. So Murad would bribe the guards so that I can come back teaching them English. And really, we were just playing chess, playing poker. <laughs> and after two and a half years, um, I mean, I don't want to ruin it, but Murad did the nicest thing mm -hmm. for me that anyone's ever done. And it, it's to this day, it's because of what Murad taught me that I make a great living playing mm -hmm. poker, wow. uh, making friends, and also... What he did to me let me know that you can find kindness mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And on death row, in Pakistan, Murad showed me the most kind thing that anyone could do. And he shared his last meal with me yeah. and he had it prepared so that I'd enjoy it. And he didn't tell me that he yeah. was gonna be hung the next day. After three years in prison, you finally were being released. How? I finally got released? Yes. Um, well, there's a lot of different things that factored in. Um, uh, I became friends with the Palestinian hijackers of 86, and mm -hmm. they got me in touch with their lawyer, mm -hmm. who agreed to take my, my, my case. But once you're a convict, the American embassy won't uh, go out of the way to get you a lawyer anymore. Really? So you have to, yes, they, they, they'll, they'll help you when you're under trial, but once you're a convict, they won't help you with your appeals. Knowing that you're innocent. Correct. And uh, I had to do a lot of bribing. I had to do a lot of, um, I, had to, I had to make a, it wasn't easy. It was, it was pulling teeth to get anything done. Mm. But I was able to finally get uh, a lawyer that was willing to just push across the paperwork that I had done for myself. Um, and it was December 16th, 2004, that I was able to get my second chance at, at court. And I went to the high court and I told them how, you know, how the lower, how the, um, at the, the lower court made it very obvious that they tampered with evidence. 
like when I was arrested, I had the suitcase with the leather goods and that was it by itself, but I had my own bags and my own backpack and my own wallet and my own cell phone. They put it all in that suitcase. Mm. So they're trying to make it look like, hey, this is obviously his because his wallet's in there, his cell phone's in there, uh, his DVD player's in there. Mm. And I was able to use that against them. Mm. I said, hey, why would I throw an expensive DVD player in a suitcase that's going underneath the plane? The whole point of having that is to make a long plane flight a lot more enjoyable. And plus it can get damaged or stolen. Why would I put a cell phone in there? What if someone calls? Why would I put my ID in there? What if the luggage goes missing? How am I gonna go through any customs or anything? Obviously, that wasn't my suitcase. Obviously, they made it look like it was my suitcase. And so I told the truth, but I used the right, their truth and their, the way I that, I, against them. I used their system against them. Yeah. So the two judges in the high court go, we believe you, but we can't say that we kept an American in jail for three years for a crime we didn't commit. It makes us look bad. Yeah but we'll give you time served. And I was like, oh, I'll take that. And uh, a week later, I was on my on, on a flight back to Chicago O'Hare Airport, mm. December 24th. I arrived December 25th. Mm. What do you want the people to get out of this after seeing your film, when they go see your documentary? What message do you want to share with the viewers? When, 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 the thing I want for people to take away from this film, mm -hmm. absolutely to be more spry. If, if, if you think I'm an idiot and you don't believe my story, that's fine, but at least you're, at least you're armed with the information that of this happens all the time, and mm -hmm. it does happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So if this can prevent someone from not having to go through what I went through, then telling the story was worth it. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for coming down and sharing your story, and it is such a great documentary, and I you know, I'm going to encourage our viewers to go see this. Um, and I hope it's, uh, they can also see on iTunes later on, um, September, probably beginning of October. Dạ vâng, thưa quý vị, đó là buổi nói chuyện đặc biệt của tôi Uyên với anh Eric. Đây là một cuốn phim tài liệu rất là hay và rất là lôi cuốn từ đầu cho đến cuối. Và mong rằng là quý vị nếu mà có cơ hội thì nên xem cuốn phim tài liệu với, với của anh. Ba năm ở bên Pakistan, đây là một câu chuyện về cuộc đời của anh Eric O'Day, thưa quý vị. Và cho chúng tôi xin trân trọng. À, kính chào tạm biệt tất cả quý vị và xin hẹn gặp lại quý vị vào chương trình kỳ tới. Thank you. Thank you so I, much. Oh yeah. I appreciate it. I'll take a hug. Oh, <laughs> That's all right. I'll pray for you. I